welcome to the introduction session. It looks like everybody's had a chance to get on board here with the session a little bit actually ahead of time. So let's get started with things. Um, we're going to be going through all the parts of the program and just having a look and seeing uh, some information as to what it's all about and what the program does. If you have any questions, the best thing to do is to type them into the program that's connecting us. If you don't get an answer today, then you'll get an answer through our support email uh, within the next business day or so, providing that it's not already the weekend at this point. So uh, let's get started. We're just going to start with the screen that you're seeing right here, which is called the business client section. Now we start here because there are some things that we're going to be looking at setting up in here that other parts of the program are very much based off of. So we're just going to do it to show the general order and flow of things. Um, the first thing we'll begin talking about is the fact that there are a few different note-taking locations that you can utilize while you're in this part of the program. So one of the ones you'll see here actually appears right away on the client's file. And this can be added by editing the client that you're looking at. So you click the edit pencil on the left, go to the tab in here called other, and then just add some notes. And obviously it shows up on the client's screen. Um, you can put as much as you want in there. However, we suggest that you might want to put information in here that you should always be aware of every time you look at this client's file because you see it right away. So like the example says, when you're speaking to the owner of this location, try not to mention this detail as they may get upset about it. And that's likely something you're going to want to know right away so that you can avoid a scenario like that. So that's the kind of information you're likely going to want to put in there is that upfront need to know type of detail. Now there are a few other note locations, but the other main one that you're going to want to utilize more frequently than anything else is a tab here called More Info, which can actually be accessed from anywhere in the program. And if you want to do that from anywhere in the software, you'll divert your attention here to the bottom right-hand corner. You'll see there are some blue circles with some question marks in them and also some phone icons. So the blue circles deal with the upper half called the missing information section of this part of the program. And then the phone icons deal with the lower half. And they can be used for both business or personal clients from anywhere in the program. What the upper half deals with, or the blue circle with the question mark, is for logging things strictly like missing information you need to locate, or questions which require an answer. And you'll see if you click the icons in the bottom right, you have to tell it which client it's for because you can do it from anywhere. If I click the phone icon, that allows me to add a communication to the lower section. This is more meant for logging basically every other type of interaction that I have with my clients. One of the things you'll notice when you first begin using the program for the very first time is that there are no communication types on this dropdown to choose from. However, you can add your own, and this will be a global thing for all of your users in the program, by clicking the little bubble just beside the dropdown, which will give you this window. And that allows you to add as many different types as you want to the system. There's no restriction to the amount you can add there. So you just want to put in whatever you find is most relevant. Some good examples are like what you're seeing on the screen, agreement, client request, approval, email, walk-in, text message, phone call, and anything else you can think of. Now, just to point out, with emails, you're not going to be dragging and dropping emails into ClientTrack from your other software, but more you would create a communication, copy the text of the email, and paste it into here. So with that in mind, you may not want to do this for every email you ever get from a client, but maybe for the ones that are very important that you do want to have as easily searchable history on their client track file, because these items can be searched and reported on any time in future. Now, not only can we log an item to a client's file as a, as a historical evidence, but we can also actually pass these back and forth to each other within the office in case we need to follow up with these items. So let's try an example here. Let's say I get a call for somebody in the office, uh, for one of my users named Tim. Tim's not available at the moment, but I know he's in the office. Now, I can see him through his cubicle glass, or I just know he's in, but I know he's either on lunch, or he's currently with a client, or he's already on the phone. So there's a reason why I can't give him this call. So in my subject, I'll put in one or two words that briefly summarizes what the call is going to be about. And then obviously I want to make sure that I choose the correct client. And finally then choose which user it's going to go to. Now you'll notice you can assign stuff to yourself. And that's because maybe you want the program to remind you first thing about a phone call when you log in the next day. So what happens is when an item has been given to you and it's currently listed as unresolved, you're going to see it on the list of items you have to take care of as one of the first things you'll see when you log into the program. And you can also call this list up manually at any time you want from anywhere in the program. We're going to give this to Tim. We're going to go to the communication. You'll likely want to click the date stamp, which records the exact 
day, moment of time you're doing this and the person adding this detail. Because if you pass this around to multiple users, then if each user is doing that, then everybody knows uh, all the different users who've added to this over time. So then I'll just type whatever details I've got for the call here and click OK to save this. The program is going to ask me if I want to let Tim notified by a pop-up right now. So if he's in the program and I know he's got it open, then what I can do is I can say yes, give him a pop-up, and he's going to be notified in the bottom right of the screen that a new communication has been added to his file. It won't say much more than that, but he'll know that he can immediately go to the bottom right-hand corner and click the little icon with a notepad on it. So if, you, if you're told that it's a missing info item, you want to click the blue circle with the notepad. If you're told it's communication, then you want to click the phone icon with the notepad, and that gives you this window, which immediately shows you all items that have been assigned to you as a user currently unresolved. And that's the same window that you're going to see when you log into the program. So let's do a quick search here for Tim's items by clicking the magnifying glass and telling it to show me his name. So there's the phone call I've just given to him. So he logs in the program. This is what he's going to see. Now in the background, he's probably not looking at the correct client's file. But what he can do is if he wants to go to that file really quickly, under the client name column, if I just click the beauty salon's name one time, just a single click, you'll notice in the background it changes from lawyer's office to Beauty Salon immediately. But you don't really need to do that because you can just scroll over to the right hand side of this. You'll see the phone number right on the item and you can also click View Info to open it. So again, from anywhere in the program, Tim can find the number, move my information down and place in his own date stamp. That would say his name because he'd be logged in at the time and then he'll put whatever updates he's got for the call here. So if the call is dealt with at this point, then what Tim's going to do is he's going to click the Resolve a checkbox to finalize the item, which won't delete it from the client's file. It just takes it off of the pop-up list of communications that people have to take care of. But we can still search that on the client's file anytime in the future. It'll just show as dealt with. If it's not resolved, however, but let's say Tim wants to let Adam know what's happened, then he can just leave it unresolved and switch the assigned item to Adam's name and go ahead and update that. So if we refresh the list, we see it's gone from Tim's information. The moment I reopen that window or just run a search for my name though, we're going to see the call has been given back to me. So again, I can now take a look and see what's going on with the information. And then I can either figure out, okay, well, the call is resolved, or maybe I need to call the client and follow up with more details and then log my updates and finally then resolve the item. So either way, when it's done, we're going to resolve that item. It's going to log the day in which we said it was finished. And then we're going to click OK to update that. So as I said, it's gone from my list, but it's still on the client's file. Now, if we full screen this window, Here's another way in which this can come in handy. So if you need to run a report on any of these items in future at any point, then what you can do is you can easily have the program call up a list of any items you might have made in future. So let's say uh, I make an agreement with a client and then a couple months go by and they try to dispute the details of that agreement with me. So what I can do is I can click the advanced search here which is the magnifying glass in the top left. And then when I'm running a historical search, I don't care if it's been intended to a specific user because we may have passed it around to different users within the office. So I'm going to remove that as a search option, but I'm going to choose the client in question. Then I'm going to choose the type here and look for agreements. And then whether or not it's resolved, I'm actually going to remove that so I search for both. That way I don't miss something by accident. And on my next tab where it says dates, I can actually choose a specific date range, a certain day, uh, on or before, on or after. Or if I'm not sure, I can just say, you know what, just give me all the agreements I've made with this client. So then once I select, yes, uh, I want to run the search by hitting select log entries in the bottom right, this is immediately a list of all the agreements I've made with that client very quickly. So immediately I can turn around and say to the client, well, here's what we logged in your file. This is the day we did it. This is the person who spoke with you. And normally that's going to be pretty good to sort of solve any disagreements. But if the client needs a little bit of further proof from you, you can also click on export to Excel. So any report you generate in the program can be also recreated in Excel file by clicking export to Excel. That's going to show the information exactly as it is in an Excel file. So you can choose to save that as a file and then maybe uh, lock it so the, the client can't tamper with it and then go ahead and send them a copy of that. So those are some of your major note-taking locations. Now, the other thing we're going to talk about with business clients is what the program's sort of core function is, and that's the ability to schedule the deadlines you have to take care of 
for your remittances for your clients throughout each year that you work on their file. So you're going to see that there's a lot of tabs here at the top, like HST and payroll and payroll source and year end and so on. So what you're going to be doing is you're going to go through those tabs on a per client basis. And you're going to tell the program how often do you remit certain things or of these types for your clients. Now there's going to be nothing scheduled by default because of course we can't presume to know the frequency in which you do things for your clients. And that's also where you're going to set it up per client because one client might be monthly, one might be quarterly, one might be annual. So you're going to see there's some options here on the left hand side and all you're going to have to do is just single click an option to say this is what we do and it'll schedule the entire year's worth of deadlines regardless of where you are in the year because again we can't also assume that the client has given you everything you need to complete things. So if anything is completed at this point then all you have to do is just close the item to tell the program it's done as of this year and that means the program's not going to bother you to notify your client or let you know about it in any way aside from just it'll know not to bug you for it until it reschedules everything for you next year. So you only have to set up your deadlines one time per client. Every year thereafter, the program will automatically reschedule all of your deadlines for the next year for all of your clients in the program. So setting up the deadlines, again, are just a one time per client setup. Now, there's a couple things to understand about the philosophy of the way in which the program works. So the first thing to understand is that the program works on a calendar year basis. So while you do see a period end column here, uh, there's also a due date as well beside that. The period end is a generic, uh, generic rule that the program is told to just sort of give you as this is normally what the period end will be in the majority of cases. There may be some odd cases where that's not necessarily accurate and there's not really any settings that you can do to change this because it's not really the focus of the program. It's more of a general guideline. The program's focus is the due date and the concept behind that is because no matter where something is from in its period, those due dates are still those due dates. Now, if a due date is incorrect, you can click and change it to what it should be. And the program will remember that change going forward to that particular client when it reschedules things. So we call these items tasks in the system. Now, another thing to understand about tasks is every time a task is scheduled, it gets placed onto a task calendar. Whether that's assigned to a user or not, there's a calendar for every user and also one for the work that has not yet been assigned. So there's actually a setting in the program you're going to want to maybe play around with before you put your deadlines on your clients. It's found in the tools menu under the edit tasks options wizard. This window that comes up breaks down all of the different task types that are available in the system, including any customizable ones that you've created yourself in your office, because you can do that. This allows you to say as a global setting per task type, whenever this kind of task is scheduled to any client in the system and we put it on the calendar, first of all, how much time of the day do we want it to take up? So this is your estimated time, which basically just tells the program, okay, we'll book aside this much time from the day. So when the user looks at their schedule, they know roughly how much time they have booked in general for their day so they can sort out their work week. On the next tab over, there's also the ability to set how many days prior to the actual deadline you want the items to appear in your system. The defaults are going to be 10 days. So what this does is it gives you a safety net to make sure that when you are looking at your schedule, you can understand that the items are not necessarily due on the days you're seeing them, but they are coming up soon. So that if you notice you have too many things assigned to you on a given day, you can feel free to move it around to another day of the week and be sure that it's not necessarily going to be moved past its deadline. So we look at your, your setting here as sort of like a first line of defense to making sure that you're not really missing your deadlines and you do have enough time to sort out your schedule so that you don't just walk in and have a day where you're overburdened with too much work. So now that you've got that in place and you say, okay, here's what we've got in terms of the frequency and you close off whatever you've completed, that of course tells the program this is what you're going to be doing for the client. Um, another thing you can choose to set up as sort of another line of defense is you see these notify checkboxes here on the right. If they're blank, it means you have not activated the notification system. This is something that is, is also set up on a per client basis. We're going to activate it by going back to the main client info tab. And on the right hand side, we're going to click on a button there labeled client option. And here you're going to get a window that has a few different tabs. We're going to look at the one called auto notification. And you can choose to say which types you want to set up. 
It's not going to make you send out a notification for a task that isn't scheduled on the client's file, so it is fine if you select all. But here's the reason why you do it individually is because now you get to say how does the client prefer to be notified. So in this case, it's email, fax, letter, or phone call, and you're going to choose one of these options and click finish. Once that's done, you're going to get a little loading bar letting you know it's taken care of that. And finally, then, we're going to see that the notify checkboxes are filled out. So after that's been set up, the very first thing that you're going to see then, and all users will see this before anything else when they log in, is the notification wizard. I'm just going to open it manually from the top of the program under client communication, notification wizard. This is designed to show all of us a list of all notifications that must be sent out from all users to all clients. Now, the reason why everybody sees everybody's is because as a team, you're working together to make sure that all of your clients are aware of things. So if one of your users in the office is on vacation for a week or they're sick for a few days, then maybe somebody else in the office can know to go ahead and maybe send those out for that user while they're gone. But there is an option to say, just show me only unsent assigned to you. So just show me just the ones I'm responsible for. And then what's going to happen when you choose to send this is it's going to work with your default email program on your actual computer. And it's going to go ahead and create a template email that you can then confirm you want to send out. But you confirm, but the reason why you get the ability to confirm is so that you can choose to attach any documents or maybe write something specific to the client. But you're going to see that it fills out the client's email address, providing you have it on file, a subject of the email, and a body of the email, which is actually customizable before you go ahead and send these out uh, based on the templates in the system. So there is a few reasons why we get you to confirm you want to do this. Uh, the first thing is, is, again, you get the ability to attach documents or maybe write something personal to the client at this point. And then also, based on some email laws that have changed in Canada in the past three or four years, um, the program itself can't just let it send things out without your permission uh, based on the fact that you know you have been given permission from your client to receive things like this from you. So when you hit send, your, your actual email gets sent from your real program. So your correspondence comes back to your real program. The only thing that's recorded in ClientTrack is the date you chose to send this, and you can use this window to run searches on those as well. So effectively, you've got your first line of defense, making sure that your items are showing uh, appropriately on your schedules, and then you've got another line stating, okay, well, make sure you send this word to the client so you get at least one notification out to them. Now, to follow up directly with that, we're going to go to the lower left-hand side and click on the task section. And in here, we're going to go to the calendar on the left-hand side to start with. So on the left-hand side, when we click on the calendar, it's going to show us our month view by default. The reason why we see the month view is that you get an idea of the total number of items assigned to you and then the total estimated time for these items right away as well. So what's important about that, is that when we look at our schedule, we have the ability to see the total number of days for the items that are in here. And then we also have the ability to quickly know whether or not we might be overburdened at any one given time. So let's say we notice that there are 15 items assigned to us on the 20th. So we could click the day to see what's going on. And we know that these items aren't necessarily due on this day. And we're not even at the 20th yet. So we could actually click and drag the work from one day to another to sort out our schedule so that things will be manageable for us. Now, effectively, when you're doing this, you're not changing anything concerning the actual deadline or the in-house date that you can set in the program. Um, the only thing you're changing is where the item physically appears on the calendar itself. So with that in mind, as part of our final line of defense, which is the task list that allows me to run reports on any tasks that are coming up due from any time period, the default view will just be to show you simply what's due for the month you're in. But we can go to the top left, and in here we can click a square with a blue line in it that allows me to adjust the columns. Now this is done per user. You can remove whatever columns you don't care about, but add in the calendar date. So when we're looking at our list now, we can see which client it's for, what it is we're doing for them, where is it specifically on our calendar, and right beside that is the actual due date. So at all times we know how many days we actually have left to get this work completed. And further to that, if I click the first item here in the column, July 29th, it's going to bring me directly to the day that's assigned. So if I need to move that over to a different day, 
then the moment I move those items over to a different day and I go back to my list, without even having to hit refresh on the list, you see that the date has already updated in here. So that calendar date is always going to be accurately showing where the item exists on your calendar, providing you've moved it to a different day. Now, you've also got your employee assigned. This is really the most common way that uh, admins will come in and run a report of what's due this month and then just start assigning items to the users that are available in the system. Uh, you also have an overall status to say, like, have you begun working on the task? Uh, are you on hold for whatever reason? Are you in progress? And then you've also got the ability to say, did you receive everything? And if you did, what was the day that you received everything? So that date gets recorded. From the day you said you got everything as well, you'll have a counter here for days in progress that counts how long you've been actively working on these files. And we'll keep counting until you close the item to show it's completed, at which point it'll change the status to also say it's completed. Now, another thing you can do in here as an added bonus, if you want to, and this is not something you have to do, but you can go to the view hide columns, and as an office, you can choose to use up to 25 customizable checkboxes, which will globally apply to all of the tasks all users, all clients in your system as part of your task list. But they can be used as a generic workflow process to everything you do. So effectively, let's say you get together as an office and you realize that no matter what it is we're working on, there is a minimum of four things we must confirm we have done before we can ever close a task to say it's completed. So you all decide, okay, everybody add in the first four steps. Now only one of you needs to go to the define button at the bottom and then actually change the names of them. That'll change it for everybody in the office. And you can also choose to give the item colors so that when you close the step, the task actually changes to that color. So that's gonna make your list look a lot more like this so that you can have colored progression so you can glance at this and kind of see how things are going. Now, if you wanna run searches based on your items in here, uh, all you gotta do is click the magnifying glass and that's pretty much how all of your major reporting is gonna do is you're gonna be in a list, you've got a magnifying glass, you specify the details of what it is you wanna see. Also with these checkboxes, if you choose to use them, after you fill one out, if you click beside it in the same column area, it'll actually show you who completed it and on what day. And in your search, you can actually go to the last tab on the right and search by whether or not a specific checkbox has been filled out or not. So let's say we know that we've left at least one notification out to the client. Now, you run a report to say, show me everything that's due in the next two weeks. That does not have the first checkbox filled out. And you realize there is maybe um, one or two items that are due in the next six days. Nothing's really begun on the item. So you leave a voicemail for the client, maybe send them another email a day or so after. But you also open a missing info ticket on their file to show you're missing something and you assign it to yourself or somebody else to take care of that. So another couple of days go by, you run the same report again, you realize nothing still has begun on the client's file. Now it's getting a little bit more worrisome. So you call the client again, you log it again on the missing info item, more updates uh, to show the days and times in which you've called enough emails to inform the client that you need information, otherwise the item will not be completed on time. So the deadline passes and finally the client's on the phone going, why is there a penalty? I thought maybe I hired your office to make sure this doesn't happen. It's gonna be fairly simple for you to go, okay, well, we were looking at our reports here, we were well aware the item was coming up, we have it listed on your file. We've left voicemails and emails on these days and times to make you aware that we needed this information and we could not get it done. So effectively, you've got the ability to show the proof in your system, providing that you and your users are being diligent at logging these things, that you did your part. So if there's any sort of onus as to who's responsible for paying any sort of remittance fees that are penalties, then the onus would fall more easily to the client's shoulders because you've got the ability to show that you did your part in your system. So you can see how if you don't start in your business client section and you put your deadlines in there first, that you will have nothing to utilize in your task list because there won't be anything to report on. And that's why we show you in that order. Next up, we look at personal clients. Uh, this is more meant to track the status of tax returns as you do them during tax season. You'll also notice that personal clients will be listed as one year prior from the year we are currently because that's the year you're going to be doing taxes for. Now, you don't have to set anything up for these guys. So the tabs you're seeing in here are simply just to state using the top checkbox, this is what we do or don't need from the client. And that stays filled out every year. And then as the program begins the new tax season, the bottom checkbox and date will begin blank so that when you click it, it'll record the date to say this is when you got that item. 
And if you want to record, or sorry, send a report of all these items together as sort of a combined report to your client, you can go to the reports menu at the top of the software and click on personal client reports and use on the left-hand side here, client documentation required, which will basically convert those tabs into what looks like a fairly easy PDF report here. And then you can just hit print at the top left and send that to a PDF. Now, if you don't have print to PDF, like you're seeing on my computer here, that's actually not part of client track, that's part of Windows. And you can just go to Google and search um, print to PDF add-on Windows free, and you'll get an installer that actually allows you to set that up for your computer so your programs can take advantage of that. Otherwise, they have all the same note-taking locations that we looked at as business clients. So their biggest thing you're going to be doing here is what's called view list on the left-hand side. This is going to show you an individual listing of each person that you've added to the personal client section and as one line, one line item. And they're going to show like this because the one thing you're doing for them here is tracking the status of the tax return. So what's going to be happening then is you're going to notice that every single personal client begins on the awaiting client status. Now, when a client first comes to see you, I've often been told that they don't bring you everything you need from the start. So maybe your first switch is going to be on hold missing info. Again, you open up a missing info ticket using the blue circle in the bottom right, and you assign somebody to take care of that. You also maybe assign a user to this client by clicking a username here on the employee assigned field. Then let's say you finally get what you need from the client, so you put them to in progress. Now your administrator will want to take a look at the check boxes that are in here and just figure out do they or do they not match the way in which you guys would normally do a tax return for your clients. Uh, very likely our default step is don't. So your admin can go and click the shoe prints here at the top to find process steps. And then they can swap, delete, modify, and add as many steps as they want. This will be a global change for not just all clients, but for all users as well. Uh, you'll also notice that when you fill out these check boxes, they get a colored status, one color across the board, but it does get darker as you go across. So you can kind of see the gradual uh, completion of things. And again, if you click beside the check box in the same column area, you'll get the who and when actually filled it out. So as you progress and you say, this is what you're doing, You've got the client status in progress. You've said you received everything. It also records the date in which you received everything and has a counter for days in progress as to how long you've been working on the files. The in-house due dates will always be listed as April 30th by default, but you can, of course, click and change that to say this is when we promised the return would be finished by. And then the item will keep counting the days in progress until you've switched the status to show as completed. So then your completed date will be updated to show this is when you got it done and then the counter will stop counting. Now, also at the bottom of Days in Progress, you've got a counter average. So you can run a report using the magnifying glass and say, show me just the clients I worked on and get an average for yourself. But if we're looking at the office as a whole, then this is going to show how everybody did. So maybe at the end of your season, you're going to look at that average and figure out, okay, well, our average is anywhere from, let's say, 5 to 15 days. You've probably had a fairly good tax season. Everything went more or less according to plan. But let's say that average is bumped up to anywhere from 20 to 30 days. So it's possible that maybe just some of your clients are kind of messing it up for you guys. So you can click any column header in any report to sort by it. The first click will be ascending order. The second will be descending order. And a third click will clear it out. So let's say we do descending. We notice that the first 50 clients in the system took way longer than everybody else. So then what we do is we pop the report into Excel. We delete all the names below the first 50 and we save the report as difficult clients. And then what we do next year is we try to contact those clients earlier than everybody else. So we don't really really track um, the days in progress for those clients in the system, but we just sort of get them done and out of the way so that when the rest of our return starts flying through the door, we track them and get a more accurate reading on how we're actually doing aside from just those few clients that are kind of messing it up. It may be even also possible that one of your competitors has closed their doors this year You've got four or 500 new clients walk into your office. You don't have enough staff to keep up with the workload. So you're logging the clients that are in, but they're sitting there for a long time because there's just work that's piling up and nobody can get to it. So that maybe lets you know that maybe next year you want to hire a temporary person on board to accommodate for that new workload that now exists in the office. So for whatever that number is telling you, hopefully it's giving you some insight as to how things are going. And if there's anything you might want to change, to sort of accommodate for that new workload.
Next up, we look at time and billing. The time and billing section uh, at its core function allows you to record the time that you're working on for your item in the system. Now, there's a few things you can choose to set up before you start putting time in the program. However, you're not required to set up anything because we do have clients who, let's say, they don't have billing rates for the clients. Uh, they have just promised that they will charge them a flat fee every six months of whatever that number is. And so all they care about is how much time are they spending in that time period. So they can make sure that on average, let's say they're used to spending about 120 hours, that they're within about, let's say, 10 hours, give or take, of that 120. So that fee still makes sense. But if you're noticing that in the, that time period, you're now working an extra 50 hours for the client, you might want to up the fee and then show the client why, because you're now doing more work for them so that that fee makes sense for the extra work you're doing. You can set up billing rates in the program. You can give each person a default billing rate. You can even set it up so that the program is told that when a certain user is working on a certain kind of task, use a particular type of charge in the system, be that a billing rate or a flat rate based on the work they're doing. The only thing you can't do is you can't say, use this rate based on the client they're doing the work for. It's the work they're doing for no matter which client it's on. Now there's a few different ways in which you can enter time into the program. You may have noticed this earlier that there is a timer located on the right hand side of the uh, more info tab notes that you can put in the system and also on the right hand side of the task. And when you click a timer that's already allocated to a client's information, then when you click that timer, it'll start counting at the bottom here under clock status. It'll know which client it's for and what you're doing because it's already associated to that information. Or you can just click under clock tools in the lower left, the generic start timer, and that'll just record time in general. So you'll see it just start recording here at the bottom of my screen. It doesn't know who you're doing the work for or what you're doing, but you can just click the stop timer to stop any time you're currently working on under clock tools and lower left, and it'll bring up the time entry window to then let you verify the details of what it is you're doing. However, a lot of people we talk to find that timers are not necessarily the best item for them because they're either in and out of the office a lot or they get interrupted really frequently, and it's just maybe not feasible to record time that way. So if you're like that as well, then you can just go and put time in after the fact. One way is to just go to your calendar, single click an open space, and you'll notice that if I single click between 9 and 10 here on Monday the 9th, it's going to open up a window that puts it in for a default of an hour between 9 and 10. Now when you save a time entry, the only thing you're required to do is to say which client the entry is for. So if you're going to put in time that isn't for a client, it's maybe just for things you did around the office today, we suggest you create a business client that is your own company, so that way you can track things that are just for yourself, like uh, general filing work or maybe cleaning up the office kitchen or whatever it is you want to say you did. So be that a business or a personal client, you have to choose who it's for. Then you can say the duration of time. Um, if it's more than an hour, then we can just say, okay, an hour and 45, and then go ahead and update that. Or if it was less than an hour, then we can just modify the hour duration here and say it's 45 minutes. So you'll see that the time here will adjust accordingly. And then if it was just a favor we were doing for the client, you can simply just type in whatever the name is of the time entry you did. But if it was for an actual task you're working on, then you'll want to choose task type first. You can only choose from the tasks that are actually assigned to the client's file from business client. And if it's something like monthly or quarterly, then task item allows you to say which month or quarter it was. Work codes and billing categories are 100% optional items in the system. What a work code lets you do is you can say um, that a work code is for a certain kind of work that has a description that encompasses that work you do in general. So what I mean by that is every item that we add to the system has a default description built onto it. And let's say I put in five different entries of the same type of work for the same client, and I go to create an invoice. I'm going to have five lines of the same description showing on the invoice, which is obviously not really relevant for me to show to the client. So let's say I create a work code that encompasses all of that work for HST. So I've got a work code called HST. It has a description that just summarizes all of that work I generally do. So I can apply each entry to the same work code. And then when I get to the invoice, I can say, okay, I want you to group by the work code. So instead of showing five lines of the same thing, I'm going to show the client 
one line of that sort of generalized information. Now, that's not the only way in which you can modify what shows in an invoice, but that is certainly one way in which you can do that. Uh, but again, they're optional. What a billing category lets me do is I can associate my time entries to internal categories that I can utilize for extra reporting options. So how this would work is I've got companies A, B, C, and D. And the work that I'm doing for these companies is different from all four of them. But in general, the work kind of overall applies to bookkeeping. So effectively, what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply all of those time entries to bookkeeping. And then what I can do from the time list later on where I can run reports of the time in the system, I can say, show me everything that I've added to the program based on that category for whatever date range you want to see. So I can get a total of the time and charges of that style of work for whatever time period we're looking for. But again, a totally optional thing. Now, the billing info tab is only for, for users in the system who have been given permission to see billing rates. An admin can say that a user that's been added to the program is not allowed to see billing rates. If they're not allowed to see billing rates, the only thing they're able to access in the time entry is to say what time or who it's for, their description, and who the billing is actually going to. So I could say I did the work for the beauty salon and the general tab but then it's actually being built to a bigger office in my system. But they cannot see the billing info tab. They also would not be able to see the time list, the create invoice section, or the view AR because those are all spots where they'd be able to see any sort of billing rates and revenue in the system. Now for those who can see it, they can see whether or not the entry is billable, the initial time entry status, what billing rate or flat rate they're gonna be charging on this item, and then you can also come back into the item later on and override the original time because let's say I did two hours in the office, but I actually did a total of three hours worth of work um, that applied to that, but I did it sort of later in the day. So I just want to come back in and just apply it to that. And that way it's not going to mess up where things show in the calendar, but it's going to add to that total time that I spent on it. Your descriptions have an internal description and then an invoice description. It'll always be uh, internal will be the upper invoice will be the lower and then like I said you can say who the time is actually being billed to now that's not common when it comes to businesses but more so where you do the remittances for a business and then they've also asked you to say okay uh, for my employees uh, I'm gonna pay you to do their tax return and just bill it to my company so then you say okay well I did the time entry for Bob and my system but the time is actually being billed to the beauty salon which is where he works because they've told us to go ahead and just take care of that for them so you save your entry, it gets put on your system, and that's all she wrote. And then you can just click and open up another one. The only time where you may want to use a different method is if you're waiting to the end of your day to put in all your entries, then maybe you want to do it a little faster. So what you can do is you can click the quick time entry item here on the left. It looks like the letter A on your keyboard. This is going to give you a window that allows you to basically do the same thing, but the window doesn't need to open and close every time you add an item to the system. So you're going to say again which client is for, what time of work you spent, what it was that you were doing, any sort of charges, inscriptions. When you hit save, the program is going to just increment to the next available time slot in the day. So you can immediately put your next entry in and then your next one and your next one. And when you're done, you would close the window and confirm yes, you want to save that. And the items will be put in uh, appropriately throughout your day on your calendar. Now, the calendar view isn't really the best way to see the details once you've actually added time into the system. However, the month view does give you a very quick total of the number of items and the total number of hours rounded up to the nearest five minutes. But if you want to see a more detailed description of things, providing you're given access to see billing rates, you can go into the time list and then just like all the other reporting sections we've seen, use the magnifying glass to tell the program what it is you're looking for. So I could say, give me everything for this client, not yet billed, for all date ranges and run that report. So in this case, this client doesn't have a whole lot outstanding. They've got three entries total at a total of three hours and 45 minutes. And if we just adjust the totals here or the columns to show the real total amount, then they've got a total of $700 in charges that are currently not billed to an existing invoice in the system. So you can run a variety of different reports and different searches based on the time that's in here by date, even by the time of day that it was entered, by um, whether or not it's been added to an invoice or whether or not it's been locked in case you have locked the entry so that no, nobody but the admin can unlock and make adjustments to it. 
Uh, you can also even use the advanced multiple select form to have it search by multiple categories, multiple task types, work codes in the system, billing rates, or even multiple employees. But no matter what, you're still gonna get one total in here. So even if I told it to give me a report of both Adam and Tim's time in the last six months, still we're gonna get one total at the bottom. However, I can then just sort it by the user's name, pop it into Excel, and then run any other calculations I want because Excel is very customizable in that regard. If you wanna create an invoice, you're gonna to go to the Create Invoice section on the left here, and you're either gonna type the client's name in the top, which will sort of automatically highlight it for you in the list, and once that's highlighted, you're gonna see a total number of the outstanding width. So as we did a search for this client here earlier, you can see the same number is showing, $700 outstanding. And then we can choose one of these three methods to create an invoice on the left-hand side. So starting from left, the, the first one will show all of the original details and total in the invoice when we create it, nothing is hidden or modified. The middle one will show the original line items that we've added to the invoice in their descriptions, but the total is gonna be whatever we type in the flat rate amount. <clears throat> the invoice creation method on the right is for the scenario where whether I'm charging for one item or a thousand items, I don't want the client to see any of the original details whatsoever, but I do wanna clear out the whip and apply it to the invoice. However, I just wanna show my own custom stuff and then type in a total. So this one will apply the whip to the invoice, but it'll hide everything and come up with this manage custom invoice item window and ask you to put your own items on there themselves. Using the manage button, the gray one in the top right, you can pre-save your own templates to the system so you don't have to keep typing things out every time. And you can put as many as you want there. So all, you really, all that really matters is when you add a new item, just give it a name and a description. If it has a constant charge, like a license fee, you can also give it a constant fee. Nothing else really matters there. And then we click the green button here in the top left of the square to tell it how many lines we want to add in. So I clicked it twice. I'm going to add in the usual and the license fee. We're going to put in the original amount of $700. And then I also want to add a few more words to this. Um, this won't change the original template, but it will add it directly to just this current invoice. So then when we full screen this, the client is now only going to see the two lines I want them to see with tax, total, and final amount. Now the taxes can be adjusted. Uh, you can set up your own taxes based on where you are within Canada. Uh, you can also set up multiple different tax types. So in case you're billing out to a different province, province you can set it up to that as well. Um, when you're done with an invoice, you would post it to save it. If you forget to do this though, the program is going to say, you forgot to do this. Would you like to, yes or no? I'm just going to say no in this case, but any invoices you create will be listed under view AR. And then just like all the other list views, we can run a report of everything we've made. Let's say just invoices for a particular client, all date ranges, so that we can see all of the different invoice numbers we've created, um, the dates in which they were created, the due dates they were needing to be completed by or well paid off. And then any original amounts, adjusted amounts, and also any differences. Now there's an explanation between adjusted and difference. So on the invoice, you can actually outright adjust the subtotal at that point. And if you adjust it as either positive or negative, the program is gonna show that as a positive or negative amount in the adjusted section. And then if you've made no other real changes after that, you're gonna show basically the same sort of difference here in this column. So if I adjust the subtotal of negative 50, and I do nothing else, then I'm gonna show an adjusted amount of negative 50 with a difference of negative 50. But let's say on the invoice, I add an extra line, because you can add a custom line as well from to any invoice after it's created, and it has an additional charge of $50. But then I go and I adjust the subtotal, negative $50. So I'm gonna see an adjustment of negative 50, but I'm gonna see a difference of zero, because from the original amount, the total is still the same. So the difference amount shows you at all times from the actual original total, did you gain or lose and by how much from that original amount? And then it will take the totals of all those positive and negatives and at the bottom show you overall then, did you gain or lose and by how much? You can then use the add payment button on the left to apply payments a client has given to you. So let's say this client has given us uh, $200. You can say what date you received it versus what date you actually put it in. And then on the next tab in here, we can, have, we can then apply the entire amount to one existing invoice, or we can click the green button again to apply it to several. 
So let's say we give 100 to the older one and then the remaining 100 to the newer one. So that uses up the deposit. That's going to refresh the list. And then we're going to see our new total amount here. So we've got an outstanding of 34,237.25. We have a total paid of 33,100. The client is vastly overdue, but they're not too far off with paying everything out at this point. Once an invoice is pre or paid off, the paid checkbox will be filled out. <laughs> All right, so next up we look at appointments. Now, if you've ever used any appointments program ever, I'm sure that you can fairly easily figure this out without any real help from anybody because it works pretty much like any other program you've seen. However, let's just point out a couple things for you here that you might not know by default. The first thing is, is that in the top right of all calendars, there is a drop down that allows you to see another user schedule. And you'll notice here that a user can choose to make an appointment private. So we're just going to simply see that you're busy for that time period, but we're not going to know what you're doing. So when you go to create an appointment, you just click an open space in your calendar. Again, it puts it in for a default of an hour, and you can choose the checkbox just above the time to say whether or not it's private. You're not required to say it's for a client at this point. You can just simply put an appointment name in, like it could be uh, something private for yourself, so it doesn't have to be for a client. Throw in the duration. Remind yourself by a pop-up if you want, uh, five minutes, ten minutes all the way up to two weeks advance notice. And there is a snooze option on the pop-ups when you do see them. So you can have it come up like five minutes later if you want. Um, you can have the appointments repeat either every day of the week to an ending date or certain days of the week to the ending date or once a month to an ending date. You always have to choose an ending date to say this is how long it's going to go on for and also once a year to, again, an ending date. Um, you can even apply to the appointments to users. So I could say, just give this to everybody, and that way everybody will have that appointment. Now, also, uh, earlier we looked at a task calendar, which was, of course, separate from this. Now, maybe I want to see my task schedule at the same time as this. From this particular calendar, we can go to the bottom right and say, merge appointment and task. So when we're looking at our schedule, we can see the tasks at the same time as our appointment. So if a client's trying to ask me for Wednesday the 20th at 10 a.m., I already know that I'm working on something there, so I'm going to tell the client, wait, let's do maybe 1 o'clock that day. This way you're not going to book yourself over work you're already responsible for. And then another thing you can do, and if you have the task showing, this is also going to affect this, you can use overlap, which allows you to see multiple user calendars at the same time. Overlap is le located on the left-hand side in the blue area. So let's say I say, show me everybody's calendar. It's going to separate your names by color, and you can change that there in the bottom right, as well as move around the order of importance. So I'm actually now able to see all users and all schedules with all tasks and appointments at the same time. So if I'm trying to make some sort of a staff meeting, then I would know that everybody's free on Friday at 12, so maybe we can do some sort of a lunch meeting together. When you are done with this view, you can go to the bottom left-ish area and click on Cancel Overlap to go back to your singular view. And then also, for those who are using Microsoft Outlook, under the File menu, you can synchronize the appointments with Outlook. So you go File, Sync with Outlook. It's going to ask you, uh, OK, which direction are you going? So from Outlook to Client Track or from Client Track to Outlook. And then it's going to ask you, OK, whose Client Track calendar versus which Outlook calendar? And then finally, it's going to ask you which date range do you want to link up. Um, we suggest you just do no more than about a two-week period. And that's mo mainly just because if it, let's say, sort of uh, has a program miscommunication, and then it puts, let's say, doubles the appointments in. Two weeks isn't a big deal to sort of go ahead and clean up a few. But if you do ever notice things like that, of course, let our developers know so that we can make changes to accommodate for that. All right, so last but not least, of course, is our project section. Uh, this is part of the workflow edition of the software. Uh, the workflow edition also includes an extra reporting option here under reports called advanced time and billing reports, which allow you to see productivity reports based on your users, the time that they're spending versus the billing charges that are going out, and then how effective their billing is being for you as an office. So there is quite a few reports that do come with that. Unfortunately, in the introduction, we don't necessarily go into too much detail about them. We just sort of make you aware that they do exist and you can play with them, uh, as well as you can utilize them in the trial version of the program. What a project lets you do is it's like a task where 
there's a lot of tasks that you can put together under one sort of overall name and track them together. However, they don't reoccur every year automatically like regular tasks do in the program. So if a project is going to reoccur, you have to tell it to manually be scheduled every year you want to utilize it. So with a project, by clicking Manage Projects there on the left-hand side, you're going to be able to add a new template. In your template, you're going to, of course, give it a name that applies to the work you're going to be doing. And then you can say how many steps it's going to take you to get it done. And for every step you add to the process here, you can give it a step name, details of what's going on, a person responsible for it. You can also choose when the dates are going to be needing to be done by, either relative to the start of the project, which is selected when you assign the project to a client, or fixed target dates, which are not quite as useful because fixed target dates, you'll have to go ahead and update the template in future before you go ahead and change it, or sorry, assign it to a client in future. So usually relative is better because then it's just automatically moving forward with you on your date. You have warning and critical dates you can set up, which will send notifications to your project leader to let them know things are not being done on time. And then you can also tell it in advance what it should be charging based on the time that you're spending on these items. But of course, the most important things are for the step, what needs to be done, and when does the step need to be finished by. Now, once you've got your template on your list, you can choose to schedule it to one client or two clients or 30 clients, and you go ahead and apply it. And it's going to ask you at this point, who's your project leader? When does it start? When does it end? Are you going to give it a budget, which will basically just split the total budget time amongst the steps that are part of the project? And also, are you going to give it a spending budget? Those are optional things. You don't have to do that. Uh, once that's done, of course, then you're going to see the project appear in the list. So much like a lot of the other list views, you can run searches on them. You're going to see the client is for, the project leader, project name, um, what the overall status is. So just like all the other lists, did you get everything? When did you get everything? How long are you working on it? And then if you want to see what steps have been done so far, you actually go to the top right and say, show me a specific project type, and then you'll see the breakdown of the steps here together. And as well as if you click beside the step in the same column area, you'll get the who and when actually did it and if they left you any further details on that particular step. So if they want to do that, the steps will actually be appearing as part of your task list and your task calendar. And a user can go to the right-hand side of a task, click on View Info, and then actually leave a note directly in here on the item itself by going to the, the Notes tab. So if they left notes on a specific task or step as part of a, pro a project, then when you look at it from the project side of things as an admin, you'll see that note over here. Now, usually most users don't come in here. It's mostly for admins to look at the project section to make sure things are done on time. Um, but of course, if you give users the ability to use more things within the program, then they can also come in here and play around with these things. Um, one last thing is at the top, there is an internal staff notification. And the second option in here allows you to actually activate the ability to say that when a step is being completed, to send a pop-up to the person who's responsible for the next step in line to let them know they can begin working on their step because the previous one's been completed. Now, of course, that's optional. You don't necessarily have to do that. Um, for those interested in using the program, if you're not already testing it out, if you head over to ClientTrack.ca, you can get the trial version of the program. Everything we talked about today is, usal, uh, is usable in the trial version of the program. So you can use all the features that we talked about for a 30-day period. You can set it up as if you had purchased it. You can add in your real clients. You can put your real users in. You can install it on all of your computers and network it across the board uh, just for a 30-day time period, of course. If the 30 days runs out, then don't worry. Your data is not going to disappear. So all you got to do is just give us a quick call um, and then say, OK, we'd like to move forward with the program. You let us know what features you want. Your still staff, or still staff will give you then uh, an accurate pricing as to what's going to be charged based on the licenses and version you're going to be going with. And then you can just pick up directly from where you left off. So we'd like to thank you guys very much for joining the introduction session at this point. Um, of course, if, again, if you have any questions as you're going through things, utilizing the program, whether that's testing it or you're already a client with us, always send your questions to support at client track and do your best to describe as much detail as you can. Let us know where you are in the program, what you're clicking on, what you're attempting to do. The more we know, the easier it is to answer that question, of course. 
And if we feel like maybe we need to call you about it, we're just going to ask you of a day and time where you might be free. We'll give you a ring. We'll maybe link up our computers and we'll help you out with things on your end. So we'd like to say thanks very much once again for joining the introduction session.